Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Coming up, we take a look at a bunch of knives in the state of the collection. Lucas Burnley and Boker Knives create a fixed blade Barlow. Yes, that's right. You heard that right. And then we take a look at 10 traditional knives. I'm taking a look at my trappers. I realized I have a, a little bit of a sub collection of trappers and it's a, uh, a style of traditional knife that not only I, I like, and I'll tell you the reasons why I like it, but it also seems to be the most common. And I think it's because, well, that's my perception anyway. And I think it's because, um, Case Knives, who is a very prolific producer of slip joint knives, seems to use the Trapper as their flagship model when they come out with a new line. And they're constantly coming out with new lines, new handle materials, new themes. They always have a Christmas one and, a, you know, all the different ones they come out with. They always have the Trapper version that always seems to be the one. I think it's because the size of it gives the biggest canvas for whatever the theme is that they're they're going after. Uh, but I don't know. I've put in a few calls to Case. I'd love to have someone from Case on the show to talk about the history of the company and, and all that. Uh, so that is all coming up. But first, a pocket check. I got to show you what I've been carrying because I've been carrying it quite a bit. And um, well, this is uh, hot on the heels of my carrying my XM18 Spanto for uh, weeks on end, and then carrying my Sabenza for weeks on end. And by weeks, I mean like two. Um, and I recently got a great deal from uh, my good buddy, Blade Freak. Uh, I got a good deal on a Chris Reeve Umnum Zahn Tanto, which has kind of been a, a knife I've always wanted. So this is the knife I've been carrying uh, this week quite a bit uh, for about a week. Um, Chris Reeve, Umnum Zahn, Tanto. So just the quick and dirty, you've got a, um, a milled uh, titanium frame lock. You have a, an S35 VN um, Spanto blade. I'm Spanto, Tanto blade with this really, I love the Chris Reeve knives Tanto blade. I love the way that uh, tip is sort of a wedge, like a zero ground wedge. Here, let me try and get this thing to focus. And uh, there we go. And of course, that beautiful stone wash on the blade. Now, this one was used, and Blade Freak, who had it before me, was not the first owner of this knife. I don't know the full history of this knife, but he was not the first owner. He took it on kind of like a foster parent or, or foster owner of this knife and took care of it, cleaned it up a bit, uh, sharpened the edge. It is razor sharp. He got to put a screaming edge on this knife. Um, which I think is a talent of his because he sent me a couple of other knives to check out and they're all, they're all like razors. So, um, yeah, razor sharp Tanto, that wedge front. So awesome. Here are a couple of really great details about the Umnum Zahn that I was excited to check out in, in contrast to the Sebenza. There's my Sebenza 21, uh, which was quote unquote born on leap day 2016. So it only celebrates a birthday every four years. Uh, but with this knife, so this is a traditional, uh, one of one of the original <laughs> frame lock folders. Uh, it's just a titanium leaf, uh, a bit of the titanium slab bent in uh, to act as the lock, as we know from uh, frame locks. And this one is just titanium on steel. I guess it's carbonized titanium, so it's nice and hard and it doesn't stick. Never had any blade stick issues with this knife. But the Umnum Zahn does it differently. The Umnum Zahn, and I'm going to attempt to show this to you if you're watching. Um, but instead of having steel meeting, oh, that's not going to work. Uh, so I'm going to do a close-up video of this knife, and you'll, you'll, I'll have a flashlight on me. But oh, you can see it right there. Okay, so instead of uh, carbonized titanium on steel acting as the lock, and then a separate detent ball in steel. Uh, this one has one ceramic ball and it's right, it's perched on the corner of this folding leaf of titanium here that acts as the lock. So when it's closed, that uh, ceramic ball that's on the very uh, corner, 
perched on the corner of that lock acts as the detent ball. That's what holds this knife in, holds this blade into the handle. Then when you open it, sorry about that. When you open it, it is that same ball that acts as the interface between the lock and the steel. So you don't have a softer material like titanium next to a harder material like hardened S35VN. You have a very hard material, um, which is the ceramic ball up against a less hard material, the steel. So there, you're getting no stick. That's part of it. And, uh, and it's also an elegant design because it, it kind of um, simplifies things. That one detent ball in ceramic perched where it is acts as both as both the detent and the lock bar insert, if you will. Um, interesting thing about this knife that others have, uh, have mentioned is that it opens up very quietly uh, by comparison. Here you have the, th the thwack of a, of a Sebenza, and then here you have the slow and subtle, <laughs> sorry, there we go. So it's just a little less quiet. Now this knife, as you've noticed, is a little, uh, takes a little bit of practice to get open. It's different. Uh, the the Sebenza, you know, it's got the terraced and uh, sort of, um, well, I don't know what you, a conical and terraced um, thumb stud, which really grips the, the thumb, sometimes painfully so, but really gets that thing open easily. With this, we uh, with the Umnums on, we have a domed smooth stud here, with, which is a little bit harder to, to get with the thumb. But you will see, you will notice how uh, both studs on either side have a little rubber gasket towards the, uh, the top of the stud. And that is, uh, these studs are not only thumb studs for opening, but they are the um, stop pin as well. So those little rubber gaskets are, you know, sort of cushion the opening, make the whole experience smoother, and incidentally, or maybe not incidentally, uh, also act as the way that I open this, because my thumb uh, up here on the thumb stud, it's just too smooth. I, I'll do this. But if I, if I can get the rubber next to my thumb, it flies open. So, and, and flying open being a relative term. I have a bunch of knives here on my desk right now that fly open because they're on bearings. This one, um, you know, uh, opens with that smooth sort of hydraulic Chris Reeve knives uh, thing. So uh, action, not thing. I, sh I can't just say thing. It's an action. Okay, so there it is. <laughs> Carried the Umnums on as I have for days since I got it. Also, uh, Blade Freak sent with me the original. It didn't come with the box. Uh, which is which is all right. I, I'm not planning on selling this, so, but it did come with the original lanyard and bead, which I think is cool. I might take this apart, put this on, uh, but I'm hesitating to do so because I know it'll be a week before I'm taking it apart and taking it off again. And this is not a lanyard I want to cut because it's from the factory. And I did that with my Sebenza, and now I, I regret that. Okay, so I carried that today, and then uh, you know, knowing knowing what I was doing today. I put this in my left pocket. I don't carry this as much as I wish I did because it's a little bit heavy, a little bit thick. And this is the Victorinox Alox. That means it's got the uh, that means it's got the aluminum handle. So this is the Victorinox Alox Pioneer X. Now the Pioneer. I'm going to open up the tools here. Um, the Pioneer is like a, a traditional scout or camp knife. What is a traditional scout or camp knife, you ask? I'm glad you asked. Uh, that is just like this. You've seen it, the Boy Scout knife uh, or the original multi-tool here. You've got a, a cap lifter screwdriver. You've got an awl or a punch. Sometimes that's a secondary blade. You have a can opener here and then you have a main um, drop point blade. Uh, this is a Rough Rider Camp King. Um, it has its issues, but I like this knife. Um, the Pioneer is just like that. That's their version of this knife. But this is no regular Pioneer. This is a Pioneer X. What does the X refer to? The X refers to the shape that the scissors make when they're out. So this, they have taken this from a two-springed or two-layer um, knife to a three-layer knife. And that third layer, and when I'm talking about layer, I'm talking about locks on the backside. You have a bunch of... Um, uh, slip joint locks on the back of a Swiss Army knife. This one has an extra one to accommodate the scissors. 
besides the toothpick and the tweezers, the scissors are my absolute favorite tool that Victorinox has to offer. So uh, I had lost my Victorinox uh, Alox Cadet. I don't know where that is. I lost it on some trip. And it really sticks in my craw. I think I left it in a hotel bathroom somewhere, something like that. Uh, so anyway, I hope that knife is serving whoever got it well, because I know they didn't steal it. I'm pretty sure that's my, that was my mistake. Uh, so I, I wanted to replace that knife, but I didn't necessarily want a cadet. I wanted the, um, I was really into the camp knives at the time, those scout knives. So I ended up getting this, but of course you have to get it with the scissors because the scissors are <laughs> pretty much what I use the most. So I was carrying these two today, and of course I had my backpack, and that is also filled with knives. You know what, I'm thinking, uh, if I didn't have such a backlog of knife videos, close-up videos I had to do, I think I would do a an audit video of my EDC bag, because it just fills up. I mean, it fills up, it's all good, useful stuff, but it's like, it's like lugging around a suitcase sometimes. So I need to empty that out, get some of the old knives out, and you know, I don't know, just clean it up a bit. Maybe maybe swap out some of the knives that I keep in there and tools for other tools. I don't know, we'll see. But uh, I think an EDC bag audit is in order either way. Okay, next up, uh, before we get to Knife Life News, I wanna talk about, I've gotten a number of boxes from good friends of the show um, filled with knives for me to check out. And I love this. I love this uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, I like building these relationships with these great people. And, um, uh, you know, right now I'm talking about this old sword. Uh, and I'm talking about um, Big Red EDC. I'm talking about Lefty EDC. I'm talking about um, uh, Jake from Bearded Gear. I mean, I've got a lot of knives in here from, from other people that I'm checking out. And um, I'm going to make videos of most of them. Um, I even have that tier one box full of fixed blade knives, which I have to make a video on. So all that being said, um, I, I wanted to touch on one knife in particular that was sent to me by Dave, this old sword blade reviews, who sent me a couple of really cool knives to check out. Um, and I'm going to we're going to talk about those in the next Wednesday supplemental. I'm going to I'm going to go through all these knives I have on loan just to show you because they're they're pretty awesome. But I want to highlight one that he sent me. And I think Dave sent this to me because um I've been talking so much uh smack about it lately. That is the Civivi Elementum. Uh I've been go going off about how um how many elementums they keep coming out with. A lightweight, a large, a small, a a uh, flipper, a non-flipper, a lock, uh, one with, you know, a, a button lock. You get what I'm saying. A lot of different iterations. It's sort of like Civivi's uh, Boker Burnley Quaken. It's a top seller. And so they keep coming out with different, different iterations of this. And from a business perspective, I totally get it. Why not? Why you'd be a fool not to capitalize on uh, such a universally loved design. But I got this, I think, from my mother, uh, that if something is universally loved, I have to be suspicious of it. Like, hmm, if the hoi polloi, or not even the hoi polloi, if, if, if the public likes it, I think I have to hate it. Like Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump came out and I was like, what is this? What is this? You're, you know, I, I, I think I was the only person in the States that didn't think Forrest Gump was a revelation. Uh, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a, a, a pandering abomination. And then I got older and I'm like, okay, I see the value of this. Um, getting back to the Civivi Elementum, the reason I'm bringing this up today, not only is it fresh in my uh, hot little hands these days, um, but it's kind of in keeping with the Trapper theme. As I mentioned before, the Trapper happens to be the test bed for a lot of different themes and designs and um, you know different lines that case comes out with and uh, they've come out with a million billion different trappers have i ever complained about that no i haven't so maybe i need to temper my um hmm, temper my temper a little bit with these knives and and be accepting so dave did me the great um um what's the what's the term i'm looking for he did me the great uh well he did me a great favor by sending this to me because I really, really like it. I would love to have this knife in particular in my collection. You know, I'm I'm always uh, 
kvetching about carbon fiber, but look at this carbon fiber. This is a non-regular patterned, like a marbled carbon fiber. And you can see hints of blue in there. And, uh, and then you move uh, aft or four <laughs> and you go to the blade and it's this beautiful Damascus. I don't know if this is, well, I guess this is Damasteel, but it is beautiful. It's a an, a 9 CR, Dave tells me this is a 9 CR um, Damascus, and it's gorgeous. And then this action is gorgeous. It, it only opens and closes with this lock, and uh, it's spectacular. So I'm swallowing my words. I mentioned this on Thursday Night Knives uh, this past week. Uh, swallowing my words about the Civivi Elementum. I think sometimes I just like to latch onto something and then like we do in my family, I beat the dead horse. And uh, I was beating the dead horse on the Civivi Elementum, but I'm changing my tune. It's an awesome knife. Uh, and I, especially in this uh, iteration, and um, well, Civivi, congratulations on having a knife that everybody wants. And now uh, I am counted among their ranks. I think that is awesome. Cool knife. Also, just incidentally, uh, he sent me another cool Civivi. This is the Keen Nader. Um, and I just wanted to put this in front of the camera real quick because for some reason I've been showing off all the knives he sent and this one keeps getting left out. But I find the Keen Nader, which is a weird name, to be a very cool knife. Um, it's a three and a half inch recurve Tanto right up my alley with, um, what is this? Uh, canvas, tan canvas micarta, also right up my alley. On bearings, you got uh, three different ways to open it. You can spidey flick it with the stud. You can thumb flick it with the stud or slow roll it. And you can you can use the uh, the flipper. Actually, you can even use the uh, the fuller on the side. So two really cool Civivis coming to me from Dave. Dave, this old sword blade reviews. Check him out. He's got such an awesome channel on YouTube and really great taste in knives. I think uh, he and I have just some very, very parallel tastes in knives. So check him out. Thank you, Dave, for sending this along. Um, you're, you're sort of helping me shed, molt, if you will, my curmudgeonly ways, especially with this uh, Civivi Elementum. I'm, I'm, I'm totally sold on this particular iteration of the of the Elementum. And uh, well, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. Uh, by the way, they just came out with one with marbled carbon fiber like this, except instead of the those hints of blue you see all throughout, uh, you get hints of red. So check out uh, the Civivi Elementum series, which is Legion. All right, thank you, thank you, Dave. And Dave also gifted me a knife in that box for my 50th birthday, which I so greatly appreciate, which we'll see downstream just a bit. Um, if you like what we do here and you think it's valuable, please check us out on Patreon. You get a little bit extra if you join us on Patreon. You get um, every interview we do now, we do a little bit of extra. It's about usually ends up to be about 15, 20 minutes of extra interview. After we cut the show, Jim was noticing, hey man, after the show, you guys have great conversation. We need to record this. And that's a great idea, Jim. So we started doing that. And uh, so we offer that as an extra. Uh, we get interview extras, you get stickers, you get a mention on the podcast and uh, well, a community. And uh, well, Check us out on Patreon if you have the druthers. Uh, the quickest way to get there is to go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. I'm going to say that address again. It's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Are you looking for a book about knives or knife collecting, knives and self-defense, or the yearly knife Bible filled with hundreds of pages of information and pictures about your favorite knives? Shop at thenifejunkie.com slash books for your traditional favorites, new books about knives, and the yearly knife Bible. Get your favorite knife book and support the show at thenifejunkie.com slash books. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast, and now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So if you're watching, you saw a flash of me grinning. And what I was grinning about, it's so cool to hear Jim's voice uh, doing, that, uh, doing that spot because... Uh, that was the first way I met Jim years ago, over about 11 years ago, 10 years ago now, uh, was producing his podcast at work. And I was like, oh man, this guy's got a voice. 
a voice for radio. That's Jim. So thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. All right. So as our fancies turn in the fall and, uh, you know, things change, clothing gets a little bit heavier. We have more pockets on us. This is when my, my attention starts swinging back to the traditional knives, to the slip joint knives. You may have caught on to that seeing as my main topic today is trappers and, uh, and, and the like. And I was also talking about these camp knives. Why you say is the fall the time that you bring out your love for slip joints? Well, it, it is that reason. In the summer, I usually tend to be a one knife guy or two knife. And that second knife is usually clipped to my waistband uh, because with shorts and lighter, lighter gear, I just can't abide by something flopping around in my pocket. And let's be honest, no matter who you are, no matter how much you love a slip joint, even if it's in a uh, leather slip case that's keeping it oriented north to south, it's still an extra thing flopping around in your pocket. Uh, and you don't get that feeling from a clipped blade. So usually summertime, I start to veer away. Uh, unless it's a barbecue, that's my caveat, in, at which point I'll bring a slip joint for cutting steak or ribs. And I'll also bring one that has a, uh, a bottle opener for opening beer. Uh, but other than that, um, it is the fall. So that's why I'm going to rehash this story. We mentioned it a little bit on Thursday Night Knives this past week, um, but I find it rather interesting the more I think about it. Okay, so Lucas Burnley. Who's Lucas Burnley? He's a, a knife designer. You know him. He was uh, Massachusetts-based. Now I think he's Colorado-based, but very prolific designer. He's had a million knives made for uh, made with CRKT and with Boker. And then, of course, he has a thriving custom, you know, handmade business as well. Another guy I've reached out to that I'd love to get on the show. Uh, but anyway, he has created a new collaboration with Boker. And no, it's not a Quaken. It's not a take on the Quaken. It is a fixed blade, fixed bladed Barlow. Whoever heard of such a thing? A fixed bladed Barlow. What's a Barlow knife? A Barlow knife is almost always single bladed. Uh, maybe by definition single bladed, but it's a, uh, well, actually I have two double bladed Barlows here, so I'm going to stop with that. But here's, here's an example of a Rough Rider Barlow. I don't have any super nice ones, but a Barlow is a folding slip joint knife that has a, usually a clip point, sometimes a spear point blade and a sleeve board uh, sort of pattern. Uh, sleeve board handle means uh, it's a little bit, it's rounded at both ends, but wider at the tail end, at the at the pommel. But the real uh, USP, uh, unique selling proposition of the Barlow is this giant um, uh, bolster that comes about a third of the way down the handle. And from what I've read, that was originally, a Barlow is a real working man's knife, uh, not a fancy affair. Um, and that extra long um, uh, uh, bolster here was for extra strength, especially for lateral kind of movements. Of course, we all know you shouldn't be prying with your slip joint or with any knife, really, if you don't have to. But uh, this extra long bolster helps accommodate that, adds rigidity. They also have longer tangs. So that longer tang fits with that longer bolster and leads to more lateral stability. Okay, so uh, Boker Knives and Burnley, uh, Lucas Burnley, have come out with this fixed bladed Barlow, and it doesn't have a bolster. So I'm left thinking, what makes it a Barlow? You know, <laughs> it's not a folder. It doesn't have the extra long um, bolster and it's not a clip point. And I don't think it has to be a clip point, but usually the Barlows I see are clip points. So I look at this and I think, um, well, this looks like a great little knife. It's a cool design. It's got a nice uh, wooden handle, very, very pretty wooden handle. What makes this a Barlow? Okay, it evokes Barlow. You look at it, you see the shape of the handle. It's got that sleeve board a little bit wider at the pommel than it is at the Ricasso, and it's rounded. Okay, that's that's a check mark. Everything else, though, evokes Barlow. So you got the, the first pin, um, the first handle pin closest to the Ricasso, and it's large. Uh, it's sort of, it looks like it might be a quarter inch um, pin there. Uh, that is evocative of a pivot, okay? Even though on most Barlows that that's been polished over and you don't see the pivot at all, seeing that 
pin there evokes pivot in our minds. Okay, and then you go down the uh, down the handle about a third of the way, maybe a little more than a third of the way, uh, but less than half. And you see those two other pins. They're much smaller pins, and they're um, you know mechanical connections, just as the first pin and the lanyard hole are. But they're presumably unnecessary. I think they are there because that's where the bolster would end. So they evoke. They evoke Barlow, you know, if you were, if this were to be a real folding Barlow, this is where the bolster would end. So it's kind of an abstraction. This is sort of an abstract painting uh, of a Barlow, abstract version of a Barlow in fixed blade. So to me, that's why it's interesting. Um, I, I, another thing that I find interesting is uh, this is a knife news. Uh, shout out to knife news. I get so much of my knife news from knife news. Uh, that it's awesome. But if you scroll down to the Knife News uh, bottom of their article, they show how it sits in the pocket. That's another thing I really like about it. It's got a uh, it's got a leather sheath, right? And it sits sits deep in your pocket with a clip that comes up and snakes over your um, sna uh, over your pocket seam, and then it presents about an inch and a half of the knife handle outside, so you can you can grab it. So it's it's they're giving you a fixed bladed version of a folding knife, but of a folding traditional knife that would ordinarily sit at the bottom of your pocket or in a leather slip, but they're presenting it to you in a sheath that makes it accessible like a modern folder. So this is a big, <laughs> this is a big mind. Uh, this is a, this is a big uh, hmm, conglomeration of different knife ideas in one. So that's why I find this kind of interesting. Will I get it? Probably not. Would I love it as a gift? Of course I would. Um, so that's uh, that's for my brother who might be listening right now. I, I find this thing to be interesting and, um, you know, it's unique. It's not really something we've seen much of before. Let's take a traditional pattern and make it into a modern uh, pocket knife. So there you have it. I think that's coming out in the month of November, uh, November 5th, 2021. Uh, that is the Boker Boker Burnley, not Quaken, Boker Burnley fixed bladed Barlow. So definitely do check that out. Looks like it'll be a cool thing. All right, still to come, we have the state of the collection. We're going to take a look at a couple of new knives in my collection and a couple on loan. And then we're going to examine 10 of my trappers, actually all 10 of my trappers. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. This knife I received uh, this past week, and I believe I've shown it off a number of times, but not here in this forum. So I just, I have to acknowledge the beauty and, and the awesomeness of this Finch Knives Devil's Finger. This knife was sent to me from, uh, from Spencer and Steve at Finch Knives. I know they sent a bunch of these uh, out to reviewers to check out, and I so greatly appreciate it because this isn't like receiving a knife. Okay, yeah, I'll check this out. This is like, I, I received this. I didn't know it was coming, and I swear to God, it <laughs> made my day. Uh, I love these Finch knives. I love the designs, and I love what they stir up in me. And I mention this all the time. I'm a sentimental Italian. I look at this thing. And I'm like, wow, this fits perfectly into my fall uh, onset uh, slip joint obsession. And that is because it blends a bit of the new and the old. Of course, you have the flipper on bearings. You have a sort of almost tactical looking design here. Uh, very useful EDC Sabre Ground uh, 154CM, one of my favorite steels ever. You've got uh, awesome, um, what do you call it, thick weave. Or, or coarse weave canvas micarta that is just so lovely. They actually oiled it up to send it out, so it was bright red, but we all know what happens with oil on micarta. It takes time, you know, it wears off in the pocket and you go back to this. And then your own personal funk signature gets in there and starts to patina the... the... So it's got all of these characteristics I love, deep clip, uh, deep wire clip, and then it's got the shield. I love the shield. I think some people complain about it, some killjoys out there complain about the Finch logo. They put uh, this shield that they put in the middle of their handles. I love it. Absolutely love it. And it's evocative of these traditional slip joints. Uh, so got this to, uh, this week. And thank you guys over at Finch. I, 
I think you're awesome. I think your knives are great. And I have a growing collection. I have five Finch knives now. This one showed up larger than expected showed up. I mean, this one is just larger than expected. Uh, it's got a three inch blade, almost on the money there. And uh, I was thinking it was going to be more like a two and a half inch size blade, like the uh, like the 1929. For some reason, I had it in my mind that it was a little bit more diminutive. This is a very perfectly. I mean, this thing, even the handle fits perfectly in my hand. Um, with that extension down here, you get all your pinky. Uh, I get all my pinky. I have medium sized hands. Uh, giant mitts might come off the end a little bit, but. Really, that's a very useful size, extremely useful blade shape, and just a pretty damn looking knife there. So very excited about this. Um, I've been carrying it kind of nonstop. It's been my secondary knife a lot recently. So I uh, wanted to show that. Next is a knife that uh, came to me from uh, in that box full of cool civivis, et cetera, from Dave, This Old Sword Blade Reviews. Here it is, another Boker. The Boker Smatch It. He gave this to me. So when he when this knife came out, this is a Chuck Gadritis design knife. Chuck Gadritis was on the was on the website. I uh, was on the um, podcast. He's a great guy and a very interesting knife maker, making one off like everything he makes is unique and uh, handmade. And he a lot of switch blades, a lot of um, historical. Uh, kind of uh, knives that give a, a nod to historical designs. Well, this was one that he did for Boker, the Smatchet. Do you know what the Smatchet is? The Smatchet is a combat knife, a big double-edged leaf-shaped combat knife that was made uh, during World War II for, uh, I believe it was mostly used in the South Pacific, uh, kind of as a, as a, all around tool, but also most definitely like a short sword weapon. I think the blade was 12 to 13 inches. And um, this is his folding version of that knife. And I think he did a spectacular job translating that uh, classic design into a modern folder. Uh, Dave got two two versions of this. They, they came out, I believe, with three versions, two different micartas, and then this rosewood. And uh, Rosewood, if anyone out there plays guitar, Rosewood is frequently used as the fretboard material on a lot of fine guitars. I have uh, two guitars with Rosewood, um, bass guitars with Rosewood, and one six string with Rosewood fretboard. And uh, it's, I love the wood. It is just absolutely beautiful. And um, so Dave got this. I commented on his uh, Instagram, man, I love those. And you know I love my Carta, but that wood... And so he sent it along in that as a as a birthday gift. So thank you so much, man. I, I, I so appreciate it. And let's talk a second about this Boker um, Gadritis uh, Smatch it. It is it looks like it's double edged, but that's just a full length uh, swedge. It is a single edge blade because when it's closed naturally, it does not hide completely in the handle. So you could not have a double edge without serious calamity. It's got a beautiful sculpted clip that is sort of uh, um, art deco-y or at least uh, these fullers here, these grooves echo the fullers in the handle, which do add to grip on an otherwise somewhat slick handle. It's on bearings and who doesn't love a non-flipper on bearings? Uh, so it has great action. It's a VG10 blade, absolutely razor sharp. Nice um, liner lock there. Flow through construction and uh, no lightning holes in the, uh, in the liners. It feels great in hand. And actually, as I was mentioning to both Chuck Gadritis and, um, and to Dave, this thing not only feels great in hand in just about every grip you can conjure up, but it is a looker. And in real life, to, to own it and to have it in hand, it looks even better than it does in pictures. So uh, very grateful to Dave for this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, Chuck Gadratus, awesome, awesome design. I know he's got a couple of others uh, out, out and about, and he's coming out with some more. Uh, on the production end, if you want one of his customs, get your checkbook ready and, you know, have your refresh button ready as well. All right. 
real quickly in the state of the collection, I wanted to show off again or just mention that I got the Umnums on recently. I think I exhausted my conversation about Umnums on. I'm just going to put it there in the lineup. And then the last one in the state of the collection is not mine, unfortunately. Uh, but in the box with the Umnums on, which I purchased from Blade Freak, he also sent me his beloved and much carried over the past, let's see, it's two, three years. Uh, Jake Hoback Quayback. All these years, I mean, this is this at this point, the Quayback has earned a spot in the pantheon of great modern robust folders up there with with the Sabenza up there with the Striders up there with the uh, um, hinderers and such. Uh, but I had never experienced one. So here it is. Uh, this is the Quayback from Jake Hoback Knives. And it is an upswept tanto, as you can see, four inches. Uh, you got carbon fiber on one side, which feels great. And that, that carbon fiber, by the way, has pockets milled out of the back to make it even lighter, as if, uh, as if carbon fiber weren't light enough. You've got a titanium frame lock side also with uh, weight reduction pockets milled out there. You've got the... Um, steel lock bar interface. You even have a lock side inlay and that cool battle axe um, cut out of the out of the um, pocket clip. So these are all of the, the parts, but this definitely exceeds, you know, is more than the sum of its parts. This knife I have, um, man, I really like, and I, I have to be 100% honest. I thought, hey man, just knowing in my mind that Blade Freak has uh, a lot of discipline and he only keeps about 12 knives at a time, and he moves other knives along when he gets a new one. I knew he had gotten a new Quayback, like a super awesome all-titanium with intricate milling Quayback. And I was like, maybe he'll offer this to me to buy. And uh, Blade Freak, if you're listening, that is not a hint. I am, I, am, I am not in that line of thinking anymore, but when he first sent it, I was like, ooh, maybe I could make this one mine too. And then I thought, God, Bob. Stop being so damn greedy. But I really, really love this thing. This is a crew wear blade, and that camo pattern is um, anodized in there, which is kind of cool. And it's, an I'm sorry, it's anodized in the, in the titanium here. So just a spectacular uh, modern folder. And uh, I have no doubt that this thing, I mean, Blade Freak has been carrying that knife, uh, he said, almost constantly since uh, 2018 when he got it. I have no doubt it is a uh, a great user. It's super stout, but man, do I love the way it looks and do I love the way it feels. So not only a great knife to use, but a great knife for the senses. That is the uh, Jake Hoback Quayback. All right. So I am going to, uh, that 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 is the state of the collection today. There are so many more on loan that I could be showing right now, but I'm going to make a special video on that just because of the numbers right now. And uh, that way I'll be able to wend my way through the close-up videos once having gotten the, the group, the group portrait out there. All right. So now, now I want to talk about trappers, traditional knives. What is a trapper? A trapper is, now there are variations, but the main design for the trapper is this, and I'll, I'll show it with my first, the first one in the list. I have 10 I'm going to show off my 10 trappers. This first one is a case knife trapper, case knives trapper. It's in smooth white bone. Let's see if I can get some focus here. That, that white bone is very bright, but it's in a beautiful uh, smooth white bone on this side. This is the, uh, the pile side. Is that what they say? The pile side. And then on the show side, actually, I don't remember what they call them. <laughs> it says, I love you, daddy, engraved in red. So this trapper I got, um, I think, Father's Day when my daughter, for like maybe 10 years ago, when my oldest daughter was uh, was just a, a pup. And uh, my wife got this for me. And I think one, I think she intercepted a Smoky Mountain Knife Works catalog that was coming to the house. And she saw this and she's like, oh, and uh, I love it, obviously, for obvious sentimental reasons, but also it's a trapper. And man, I love these trappers. What do I love about them? What is a trapper? A trapper is almost always a two-bladed jackknife. Jackknife meaning that the blades both come from the same end. 
uh, fold out from the same end. And most trappers have something like this. This is called a California clip blade, that real long clip blade. Uh, I mean, where the clip is very long and slender. And then it has a spay blade. Here's the spay blade. Now let's take a look at the spay blade for a second. What's up with that blade? It is a long, straight cutting edge with a, with a tiny belly at the tip and then not a piercing tip. You know, this, this really abrupt clip here makes it so that point is not very sharp. I mean, I guess if you, with a lot of force, you could jam it into something. Uh, but this blade is called a spay blade, S-P-E-Y. And it's for the reason you might be suspecting. It's to spay animals, to cut off their testicles. This is what is used, um, uh, you know, presumably by farmers and people who do that kind of thing. Uh, I, I don't, but I have no doubt this would be a great implement to do that with. All right, we're going to veer from that unpleasant topic and just talk about the shape of that blade. So this point is the point. It's so that when you're, you know, around there, down there doing some cutting, you want to be very precise. You don't want to hit anything extra while you're down there doing that job. So they, uh, so that abrupt clip and that sort of abrupt belly are there so that you can get some cutting at the tip and you can get some curve there but so that you're not puncturing anything else. Because, because as, as I imagine it anyway, no one stands still to be spayed. And I don't know, I don't know, maybe they, you know, maybe you tranquilize a bull before you spay it, but something tells me you don't. I don't know. So you have a, you have a, a, a point there that if the animal is moving, backs into it or whatever, you're much less likely to puncture things you don't intend to cut. So. You got the spay blade on this side for spaying animals, and then, and then you've got the clip point here for everything else. And uh, let me explain to you now how I use it, since I don't spay animals uh, when I'm carrying a uh, trapper knife. I use the clip point for e everything, anything, and then I use the spay blade, which looks to me like a really sharp butter knife. I use that for food. I think these make great food knives. Um, I've taken them out to dinner. If I'm not using my um, my usual fancy out to dinner steak knife, uh, I'll frequently take a, a trapper. Usually the next one that I show is the one I take. And uh, I use this to cut food. It's a great food knife. Um, so there you go. Uh, if, you, if you're not into spaying animals or if it's not part of what you do, uh, I bet eating is part of what you do. Uh, trapper knife is great as a dining knife and an all-arounder. So the first one is this, and I'm going to leave it open with the blades open so you can see it. This is the I Love You Daddy Case um, Trapper. I'm going to put this right here. Right, y'all. And then the others I'll just kind of put in there. So you have your spay blade and you have your California clip point blade. A couple of different kind of blade shapes, uh, uh, clip point blades. You'll hear California clip. That's this where the clip is really long and the whole blade uh, is kind of slender uh, if you're talking width compared to length. Um, there's also something called a Turkish clip point, which I have one here. A Turkish clip point is kind of like this. Uh, almost no clip. The clip starts way back towards the end and it's just a long slender um, cutting blade. This is not a trapper. This is a hunter. It's a bigger knife with a different tool set and very cool. But uh, so you'll hear and see on trappers when, when the trappers are medium or small, they will frequently have that um, Turkish style clip point blade on there. All right, next is another case trapper. And this is the, the most classic of the case trappers. It's got the yellow Delrin, if you ask me, that is. It's got the yellow Delrin plastic handle and CV blade steel. Uh, CV blade steel is what, um, is what Case Knives calls their um, 1095, their high carbon steel. It's CV chrome vanadium steel. Uh, this stuff is sharper and better than the True Sharp stainless steel, which is about a 420 HC. That is uh, heat treated kind of soft on, on their stainless steel. 
Uh, but their chrome vanadium steel, their 10, 1095, is really, I, I love it. I like it much better than the stainless steel. It's sharper. It seems to hold a, an edge longer. And it seems to be easier to get sharp without without a without a burr that isn't. I don't know. It, it's just an easier knife to sharpen, uh, easier blade steel to sharpen. And through use, unless you're cleaning it constantly, it picks up a really nice patina. And uh, all the patinas on my knives are from food. I, I don't really use them for much else. Um, but there you go. There's the spay blade, and there is the California clip point blade, um, beautifully patinaed. Um, this knife I got at Dick's Sporting Goods, I don't know, eight, five, I don't know, some years back. And uh, But what I love about it is that yellow Delrin, when you carry it, you know, I've carried this quite a bit, starts to look old kind of quickly. So to me, this uh, case um, trapper in yellow Delrin and CV blade steel, not knowing the exact history of all the design changes and little tweaks they've done over the years. To me, it looks like an old one. To a case aficionado, they'd say, oh no, of course that's not an old one. It's got this and this and the markings and that and that. But I'm just saying at a glance, uh, that CV uh, steel that's nicely patinaed and that sort of almost patinaed um, Delrin, yellow Delrin, and by that I would just mean it's like a patina of scratches on it, make it look old. And I, I do like that about about this. Now, if you're interested in in these kind of traditional knives and you like case knives, but you don't want to deal with their C, with their stainless steel knives, I highly recommend the CV uh, steel. They they it's a it's a fraction of what they put out comes out in the CV steel, but they have a, a really nice line of yellow Delrin and CV. They also have a really nice line of uh, one of the bones, uh, some like autumn jig bone or something like that in CV. And uh, so you can you can get chrome vanadium steel from Case. And and I, I do recommend that. And, and I would say I recommend it over their stainless. Um, it, it just depends on how you use. Now, Case knives are for light to medium work, most of them, um, in terms of these slip joints, is what I would say. I, I wouldn't hard use any of these. And by hard use... Uh, I don't even know what I mean by that, but I wouldn't be doing lots of woodwork with these for too long. Um, I'm just going to stop right there. Okay, next is a single bladed trapper. This is a slim line trapper from Case. They have a whole, you know, this is just one of their standard models uh, that comes with every, pretty much every uh, cover or series iteration they do. And what is it? It's about the length of a regular trapper that they that they put out. It's about the same length, but it's a single bladed clip point knife. So you got that long slender clip point blade. Uh, this is from their worker man series. I think worker man, work, working man series. Uh, every couple of years, every year or so, they come out with a new working man series where they change the color of the Delrin. Uh, for a while it was blue and they had red. Um, and they've had others. This is uh, this brown, and it's faux jigged. You know, it's molded um, plastic to look like jigged bone, basically. And I bought this knife because I discovered a an old mom pop hardware store uh, in a town close by to me. And I walked in and I saw a case case a case of case knives. And I thought, man, this does not happen enough. I don't see this enough. So I I decided. Uh, you know, I don't see mom and pop hardware stores enough, and I don't see case knives cases in hardware stores enough. So I decided I would support that effort, and I got this knife. I carry it every once in a while. Um, it's a useful blade. You can, again, you can get that, their true sharp stainless steel. You can get it wicked sharp. Uh, it just doesn't last that way for too long if you're doing hard use with it. Um, so there it is. That's the slim line trapper, and, uh, I really like the concept of the slimline trapper. All right, next is a it was an impulse Walmart purchase uh, several years back. I saw uh, a package of Schrade old timer knives. They had this and a small solo blade, uh, which is somewhere over there. And uh, they're I bought them because they were together twenty bucks. And I've really grown to like these knives. They're kind of ugly. I don't 
particularly like the way they look. This is a Delrin. It's a saw cut, a faux saw cut Delrin, which means they have that sort of um, concentric curved grooves in there to make it look like a, a circular saw. Saw this Delrin out of a giant Delrin log that was harvested from the great Northwest Delrin forest. And, uh, it's a very useful knife. I, like I said, it's it's not it's not the best looking one in the collection, but this, ever since I bought it, has lived on my desk at work, and I've used it for a million things. Um, I have a couple of knives at my desk at work, uh, but this one I leave out right on my computer. I'm not concerned about anyone stealing it, and uh, and I use it all the time, and it's really useful. Uh, a couple of things that stick in my craw about this knife, though are the bolsters. The bolsters are not nickel silver. They're something else. I'm not sure what it is. And they, uh, on one of them, I don't know if we'll be able to see it with this camera. One of them, I touched it and then never wiped off my fingerprint. So my fingerprint is permanently emblazoned on, uh, on the bolsters here and I can't polish it out. Uh, well, I haven't tried with anything grittier than flits. So it's not going to polish out. Uh, so I can't do any crimes with this knife because if they find it, they'll know it's mine. Uh, but really, the fit and finish of this knife being essentially $10 because I bought two knives and a package of uh, two or two knives and a package for 20 bucks. The fit and finish is excellent. I mean, the the springs, everything down here on the springs, totally even, totally flush. Um, feels great. Of course, there's no half stop. So it's not flush at the half stop because there is no half stop. Uh, but you have two blades again. These are hollow ground, which is kind of nice. And I suspect it's 420 HC. Uh, and why do I suspect that? Uh, because it feels a lot like the um, Rough Rider style of stainless steel. And uh, that's 420. I have another, I have a rough, uh, I have something else coming up that whose steel reminds me of this if that made any sense. But uh, so this is hollow ground, very good cutter, um, gets very, very sharp. You know, it doesn't hold that edge for long, presumably. I haven't used this for much to even dull it. And sometimes at work, if I'm doing something, reading something and need uh, to get my hands fidgeting, I might strop this knife over and over. So it, it does get very, very sharp. And, uh, you know, with the limited use, even sharper. So let's look at the... Uh, Let's look at the spay blade here for a second. Here, let's close these both up. The spay blade is a nice parallel. You know, you've got uh, a um, almost parallel, but you can see a touch of a recurve there. I am not sure if that's on purpose or if that's just, you know, some of your less expensive knives that are less labored over. Uh, you'll see a recurve in the sharpening because they spend a little bit more time towards the towards the Ricasso, trying to get that area sharp. So it just naturally will, uh, you'll get a little recurve. One thing, uh, the, the grind really widens out towards the tip of this one. So I can get it really sharp to about here. And then this very end part is not very sharp at all, which, uh, you know, if I really cared, I could go in there and, and take care of that and thin that out. But um, not only do I not really care, but it's kind of in keeping with the role of the spay blade. You don't want that tip to puncture unnecessarily. So uh, maybe it's a happy accident that it's a little dull towards the tip. Okay, next is another cheap but but rather <laughs> fun uh, trapper. This is from Cabela's. This is a Cabela branded knife. And uh, I came about this in a very gratuitous way. I just I, I discovered that there's a Cabela's close to work, close-ish to work. So I drove out there, went to Cabela's during my lunch hour one day, and I was like, I can't take this trip and without commemorating it with a knife purchase. And so I got this trapper there, haven't used it. Uh, um, it's pack of wood, you know, so it's that sort of laminate wood there. And um, it's got the same sort of bolsters as the uh, shred there, as the old timer. So I think that with time, this is relatively new. I think with time, this will do the same thing. So I better be careful to wipe my fingerprints off this before I ever put it down. It, I feel like it might be made by Schrade. It has some very similar characteristics, though it is not hollow ground. 
uh, but it has that California clip point blade. Um, unsure of the steel. I think it's 420 HC. I think it actually said that on the package. And then you have the same issue with the tip of the spade blade on this one. Uh, just a little bit oblique, a little bit thick at the tip there. Uh, but again, if you're spaying an animal, that might be a blessing in disguise. This one, fit and finish is not so great. When you run your fingers over the spring and over the over the springs and the liners, and the they're all on different levels. It's like a stair step here. Uh, but there's no blade play. There's no wobble. Well, there's a little wobble. Uh, but it's a otherwise a pretty stout knife for 20 bucks. This is a... Uh, a you know, be a pretty good knife to have and use. Uh, so that's the Cabela's pack of wood knife. Okay, the next one, or trapper knife. The next one was a gift from um, BJ Hill. BJ Hill does some really, really outstanding knife mods. And he sent me a package with a couple of knives a long time ago. Uh, well, over a year ago. And um, this was one of them. He said, please keep this knife. Uh, I know you like traditionals. I know you like Rough Riders. Check this one out. So this one is a copper and bone. It's from a line that they did several years back. So uh, yeah, you can see copper punctuated by bone. Uh, very nice looking handle here. Um, incidentally, when this showed up, I pulled it out of the thing and one of these bones, bone uh, pieces fell off. I re it on there. It's been strong and everything. But that just reminded me, you know, Rough Riders are a budget brand, though they are an outstanding budget brand. I really, I mean, their knives are really great. If you can get by 420HC, which is what they use. Um, but I mean, uh, Buck uses 420HC. We know that Case uses 420HC. It's, it's mostly about the heat treat. And I think this is just anecdotal from just running it over my sharp maker. I think that Rough Rider has a better heat treat of their 420HC than Case. I think they make it a little bit harder. Case has theirs about the 5456. I don't know. I don't know about uh, the Rough Riders, but it feels harder when you're, when you're uh, actually running it over stones. Interesting thing about the Rough Rider blades on some of them, this one has a half stop, by the way, not flat. Uh, the spring is not flat at the half stop. Uh, interesting thing about this blade, this is one of the few, this is the only of mine, uh, and one of the few out there dark coated blades, like an acid stone wash blade. And I think it looks nice with this pattern here, with the, with the copper and stone, or copper and bone. But like some old school knives, it's got the double pull. It's got the long matchstick pull and it's got the short uh, nail nick style uh, pull. These are called matchstick pulls because if you can look closely, uh, milled into them are little serrations. Uh, so you could light a match, a strike anywhere match right in the, in the, in the nail neck of the blade. And it's got two. I, uh, I appreciate the utility of the double nail neck thing but I do not like the looks. I, I really don't like the way the double nail neck looks on these, but again, first world problems. Um, but if I'm just sitting here talking about trappers, which is what I'm doing, that's something I'm going to say. So there you go. Next up is also a rough rider. This is a sow belly trapper. And as you can see, the handle evokes the belly of a sow hanging towards the ground. This is probably of all the Rough Riders I have, and I have a good number of them, this is probably the very best produced one I have. It is absolutely smooth on the back. Uh, the fit and finish is outstanding. Uh, this bone is just gorgeous. Um, it is, they, what do they call this? A, a smooth amber bone, amber smooth bone. I, I like the shield in this one. It's got the single match stick pulls and the blades are just awesome. First of all, that clip point blade is great. You've got really nice walk and talk on this one. Here, let's do it right by the mic. Great walk and talk. Very sturdy uh, spring action here. And uh, and just excellent fit and finish. The blade is a little shinier than I prefer it to be. I always get suspicious of, of shiny, less expensive steel. Uh, but whatever. That's that's my own that's my own issue. Oh, this is 440 on this one. It says 440 razor sharp steel. 440A. I was saying that they do 420. I'm sorry. 
uh, Rough Rider uses 440A stainless steel, not 420HC. Sorry, my bad. All right, next great thing about this knife, and probably the coolest thing, is look at that spay blade. Now that is a gorgeous spay blade. Uh, you've got a nice belly towards the, the tip, more of a belly than most. And that sort of uh, echoes the shape of the handle. And you've got a nice long swedge on top. And then the the overall shape of the handle, that, that sow belly shape, actually um, gives you essentially the effect of a recurve because, uh, but the curve is not in the blade, the curve is in the handle. What I mean by that is that it presents the blade at a downward, more of a downward angle than one of the straight bladed um, trappers. So I think that's really cool, very useful. I'll leave this one with, the, uh, with that beautiful spay blade out. I really, really like Rough Rider spay blades. Um, they do a mousse that has a spay blade on one side and a clip point on the other. And that the spay blade is like, wow, it's nice and curvy. I really like how it looks. And I don't know, maybe that defeats some of that spaying purpose, but I love it. All right, last three knives are my premium trappers. These are from Great Eastern Cutlery. And uh, this next one, is besides the ones given to me by my grandpa or my daughters, this is my absolute favorite slip joint knife uh, in my collection. And uh, man, I love it. Uh, this was my first GEC knife. This is a number 15 uh, farm boy knife. And uh, the 15, they've come out with a number of iterations, the boy's knife. Um, and this is called the farm boy because it's got a spay blade. That's the secondary. Uh, the number 15 has come out many different times with a, a single blade, with a pen blade, with a, uh, with a razor style blade, with uh, uh, secondary, with all sorts of different uh, iterations. But this is my favorite. So you've got the gorgeous clip point blade here. And by the way, the patinas on this 1095, just lovely. Um, and then you've got a great spay blade. I love the Great Eastern Cutlery spay blade. That very nice, very nice patina. Um, but this one really gets me because of the handle covers. Uh, this is um, antique yellow jigged bone, and it is just absolutely gorgeous. It reminds me of fall. I look at this um, handle cover, and it just just says fall to me, especially right here where the yellow and the amber and the orange and the brown and the black all come together. It's just, it's just sublime. I love this knife. So uh, this is a pretty valuable one, I think. Um, it just so happens that when this knife was out is when I keyed into Great Eastern Cutlery. So I got that one. Um, and now I find out from Great Eastern Cutlery collectors that this one is now kind of hard to find. So, uh, very, very beautiful, beautiful knife. All right, next is something that Great Eastern Cutlery calls the improved trapper. It's on the 38 frame, right? 38? Let me see. Okay, well, first of all, let's take a look at it right here. It's in uh, beautiful pickle green bone. <laughs> I love that color, pickle green bone. And this one, instead of a spay blade, I, I have to check the number, hang on. Uh, it's a 48. I'm sorry. It's on the 48 frame, not the 38. Okay. So this is their improved trapper. Now you look at it. It has a, this is more of a Turkish clip than a California. Pretty sure. I don't know. I might have people out there debating me on the issue, but so you've got a Turkish clip point blade, long slender with that clip starting all the way near the Ricasso. Nice and thin, nice long machine cut swedge on top. Incidentally, um, you've got the Unexcelled Northfield Unexcelled Shield. That cloud shield looks cool. Oh, that's not a cloud shield, actually. Uh, but here is what I think they refer to when they say improved trapper. So they have they have replaced that spay blade with a Warncliffe blade. So perhaps this is not the ideal knife for spaying an animal or an improved knife for spaying an animal, but I believe it is an improved knife for utility because um, that sort of utility tip for these kind of draw cuts is, you know, nothing beats it. 
nothing beats it. So if you're buying a trapper as an all around utility knife, maybe not as an animal spaying knife or as a steak eating knife, uh, maybe they are right. Maybe this is indeed an improved trapper. Uh, it's got the 1095 blade steel and, and bone, as I mentioned, nickel silver bolsters. Uh, all the nicer ones have the nickel silver, uh, the, the, the Schrade, the Cabela's, and some of the, um, some of the Rough Riders don't have that. Um, but great knife. I, I, uh, I had a patina on this. I flitzed it off. I've, I went through a stage where I was removing all the patinas, uh, except for on this one. So there's your improved trapper. And last, but certainly not least, is the Goliath of the group. This is the, ah, see, do you hear me? Ah, the effort, it's so big. Uh, this is the number 23 Trapper by Great Eastern Cutlery. Um, just a big boy here. And it's the Northfield Unexcelled line. And when you flip it over and you look at the show side, look at that. That's the bullet shield. It says unexcelled in there. That's the bullet shield that we know from the classic Remington Trapper. Now, uh, we all know that now Great Eastern Cutlery has made for Remington new versions of their Trapper. It's smaller than this, but it looks almost exactly like this. Uh, so now, uh, uh, let's see, Remington started making that Trapper a long time ago, and then they stopped, and then Queen Cutlery and some other uh, cutlery companies along the way were making the bullet Trapper for them. Uh, now Great Eastern Cutlery is doing that. But before that all happened, a couple of years back, they came out with their 23 in the double-bladed trapper model. And I love it. I love it. Uh, that clip point blade isn't much of a clip point at all. I'm not exactly sure if that is a Turkish clip or if that's just a drop point or if that is just a kino <laughs> clip in name only. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to close the clip point. This thing is a, has a very, very stout walk and talk, very sturdy blades, uh, sturdy springs. Oh, by the way, this is called Red Tail Jigged Bone. Just beautiful. They do such an awesome job with their covers. But let's take a look at this spay blade real quickly. It is the ultimate. So this spay blade is nice and wide, which means to me that it's going to be even thinner behind the edge, therefore making it even better for spaying an animal. Uh, you know, the sharper the knife, the less you feel the cut until a little bit later. So if you're standing behind a bull and you're trying to change it from a bull into something else, uh, you might want it not to feel what you're doing. So to me, uh, this is a, a nice thin blade stock, very broad, very sharp, very thin behind the edge. To me, this is going to be the ideal blade for removing the testicles of a bull right here. Perfect spay blade. All right, I'm going to put this one down across the group and let you take a group, a group look. I'm going to rattle through these real quickly. We have the case trapper i love you daddy model in white smooth bone with the true sharp stainless steel blade we have the classic yellow delrin and cv full size case trapper we have the slimline trapper in the brown delrin from their workman series we have the shred made old timer here with the uh, saw cut delrin cabela's in pack of wood and uh, 20 uh, 420 hc we have the old Rough Rider copper and bone model with the black acid wash, which is kind of neat looking. Uh, my favorite Rough Rider, the Sow Belly with the amber jig or with the amber smooth bone. And then my favorite knife of all of them here, the number 15 Farm Boys knife from GEC. We have the GEC Northfield Unexcelled Improved Trapper here with a worn cliff blade. And then last but not least, we have the number 23. Uh, Pioneer from GEC uh, with the with the ultimate spay blade in red tail jigged bone. All right, let me know, people. Do you have a shift with the seasons? Do you start to shift back to other knives like I do to the uh, to the old slip joints this time of year because of the clothes I wear and because of uh, how much easier it becomes to carry them? I would like to know. You can call the listener line at 724-466-4487 and leave me a message or just comment down below and let me know what you think. I'd love to hear what uh, 
what slip joint knives you love to carry and uh, and how your seasonal knife carriage changes, if that's a word. Uh, coming up on Sunday, episode 258 of the Knife Junkie podcast, I have Matt Chase of Hog Tooth Knives on. Uh, Matt made my 50th birthday um, commemorative, uh, what do you call it, uh, loveless design um, subhilt fighter. It's an amazing creation, uh, the prized knife in my collection, and we talk all about making it. It was quite a challenge. So uh, join us then, and of course, join us next Wednesday for another midweek supplemental show. I'm going to show off the uh, uh, some of the amazing knives I have on loan here from various friends around the world or around the country in the knife world. And uh, of course, Thursday night, our live stream. Check us out. It's on Facebook, Twitch, and of course, right here on YouTube. All right. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.